In today's video, we're going to talk about Stevens Johnson syndrome. So Stevens Johnson syndrome is a rare but very serious disorder of the skin and the mucous membranes. It's usually a reaction to medication that starts with flu-like symptoms, fatigue, things like that, followed by a painful rash that spreads and blisters. Steven Johnson syndrome can occur from even over-the-counter medications like Tylenol, but also from medications that medical doctors, doctors of osteopathy, and even optometrists prescribe every day like antibiotics. And today we're gonna to talk about this serious disease and its effects on the eyes. Welcome back to Eye School with me, Dr. D, where I teach you about products and treatments related to dry eye syndrome and eye beauty so you can have healthy, beautiful, comfortable eyes. Make sure to give a little tap on the subscribe button to stay up to date with all the latest eye tips and tricks I have for you. So Steven Johnson syndrome often begins with a fever and flu-like symptoms. It occurs after you've started a new medication or been on a medication, and within a few days, the skin will start to blister and peel, forming really painful raw areas called erosions that resemble a severe hot water burn. The skin erosions usually start on the face and chest before spreading to other parts of the body. In most affected individuals, the condition also damages the mucous membranes, including the lining of the mouth and the airways, which can cause trouble with swallowing and even breathing. This painful blistering can also affect your urinary tract and genitals. And why we are discussing it today, Steven Johnson syndrome often affects the eyes as well, causing irritation and redness of the conjunctiva, which are the mucous membranes that protect the white part of the eye and line the eyelids, and damage to the clear front covering of the eye, the cornea. Severe damage that occurs to the skin and the mucous membranes makes Steven Johnson syndrome a life-threatening disease. Because the skin is normally acting as a protective barrier for you, extensive skin damage can lead to a dangerous loss of fluids and allow infections to develop. Serious complications can include pneumonia, overwhelming bacterial infections, shock, multiple organ failure, and even death. About 10% of people with Stevens Johnson syndrome die from the disease, while the condition is fatal in up to 50% of those who have a more severe form or, or have toxic epidermal necrolysis. Among the people who survive, there are long-term effects of Stevens Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, which can include changes in your skin coloring and pigmentation, dryness of the skin and mucous membranes, excessive sweating or hyperhidrosis, you can have hair loss or alopecia, and abnormal growth or loss of the fingernails and toenails. Other long-term problems can include impaired taste, difficulty urinating, and genital abnormalities. And a small percentage of affected individuals develop chronic dryness or inflammation of the eyes. Now that's what the article said, but I can tell you as an eye doctor and someone who trained in larger ophthalmology hospitals, I have seen patients with Steven Johnson syndrome who have significant dry eye issues and significant massive issues with their eyes, including increased sensitivity to light, really, really light sensitive, and vision impairment from what happens to the cornea. Now, Steven Johnson syndrome is a rare disease. It only affects one to two million people a year, which seems like a lot of people. Steven Johnson Johnson is actually the less severe form of the condition, and it's more common than toxic epidermal necrolysis. People who are HIV positive and those with a chronic inflammatory disease called lupus are more likely to develop Stevens Johnson than the general population. The reason for the increased risk is unclear, but immune system factors and exposure to multiple medications may play a role. There's also several genetic changes that have been found to increase the risk of Stevens Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis necrolysis in response to triggering factors such as medication. So it could be that you're more genetically prone and then that medication is just the trigger that causes the SJS um, or 10. 
Most of these changes occur in genes that are involved in the normal function of the immune system, so it seems to be a problem there. The genetic variations most strongly associated with Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis occur in the HLA-B gene, and this gene is part of a family of genes called the human leukocyte antigen HLA complex. I believe I've talked about HLA complexes before when we talked about anterior uveitis in this video here. The HLA complex helps your immune system distinguish the body's own proteins from proteins made by foreign invaders, such as viruses and bacteria. And studies suggest that having an HLA-B gene variation associated with Steven Johnson syndrome causes your immune system to react abnormally to certain medications. It's a process that's not actually well understood, but the drug being taken, whether it's Tylenol or a prescribed medication, say an antibiotic, it causes immune cells called cytotoxic T cells and natural killer or NK cells to release a substance called granulysin that destroys cells in the skin and mucous membranes. And the death of these cells causes that blistering and peeling that is characteristic of Stevens Johnson syndrome. Now, you're probably probably wondering what drugs are most frequently associated with Stevens Johnson syndrome and they include several medications that are used to treat seizures so carbamazepine, lamotrigine and phenytoin but also allopurinol which is used to treat kidney stones in a form of arthritis called gout. There's also a class of antibiotic drugs that can cause it called sulfonamides, nevirap which is used to treat HIV infection, and a type of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs called oxycams. But there's other factors that can also trigger Stevens-Johnson syndrome. In particular, these skin reactions have occurred in people with an unusual form of pneumonia caused by an infection with mycoplasma pneumonia, and in people with viral infections, including cytomegalovirus, which is also really common in patients who are HIV positive. Researchers think that a combination of infections and drugs and a, a decreased immunity in general could contribute to the disease in some individuals. In many cases, no definitive trigger for an individual Stevens Johnson is ever discovered. So there's some other names for this condition. It can be called drug-induced Stevens Johnson syndrome, Lyell syndrome, mycoplasma-induced Stevens Johnson, Stevens Johnson toxic epidermal necrolysis spectrum, or toxic epidermal necrolysis. All right, so what does Stevens Johnson syndrome look like in the beginning? As you know, it can start with just flu-like symptoms, like having a high temperature, a sore throat, cough, and some joint pain. You can have a rash that appears a few days later, and it's made up of circular patches that are darker in the middle and lighter around the outside. Now, how quickly will Stevens Johnson syndrome progress? Well, within about one to three days, a red or purplish rash tends to form, and then that's when the skin begins to blister and peel, leading to these raw areas of skin that are painful. This can start on the face and then spread to other parts of the body. I mentioned Tylenol before. Rarely, acetaminophen can cause serious, potentially fatal skin reactions, such as acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, which is shortened to AGEP, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Other drugs used to treat fever and pain and body aches, like NSAIDs, also carry the risk of causing serious skin reactions. However, there doesn't appear to be cross-sensitivity between acetaminophen and other pain reliever or fever-reducing drugs. So will you survive Stevens Johnson? Well, you should know the following information first. Both Stevens Johnson and toxic epidermal necrolysis were once thought to be separate conditions, but now they're considered part of a continuum. Stevens Johnson represents the less severe end of the disease spectrum and toxic epidermal necrolysis re represents the more severe end. So on that less severe end for Stevens Johnson syndrome, about 10% of people die from the disease, while the condition is fatal in up to 50% of those who have toxic epidermal necrolysis. So survivability of Stevens Johnson really depends on where you fall in the scale, but let's say you have a less severe type, there's about a 90% survival rate. All right, so that was a heavy topic today. Stevens Johnson syndrome is something that, thank goodness, I have never seen in my private practice. I hope to never see it in my private practice. Um, however, I have seen it 
in larger centers like Bascom Palmer where I did my residency. And my experience with Stevens Johnson, like I said, was that it really affected the eyes in terms of being extremely light sensitive, causing significant conjunctival and corneal scarring. And some of the patients actually ended up with what's called a keratoprosthesis or K-Pro device, which is an implanted lens in the eye that helps a patient see again. If you're interested in me making more videos around this topic or even hearing more about a K-Pro, definitely let me know down in the comments below. And if you have made it this far and you're not already subscribed to my channel, please hit that button in the bell so you don't miss notifications. That is gonna be it for today's iSchool. Class is dismissed. <laughs>